Yeah, so maybe we can start? Yes, please. Thank you, I think. So, uh, first of all, we should uh, introduce our uh, lecture. Oh, Kosa. <laughs> Excuse me, just reading the chat. Uh, so, um, yeah, welcome uh, everyone to the lecture series uh, Housing Question. Um, this summer, uh, made by us, uh, Higher School of Economics, Graduate School of Urbanism, uh, with the support of um, Deca Briston, uh, NGO based in Berlin, and um, Kosilungen Competence Centrum, <laughs> so yeah, uh, the organization organization which is also based uh, in Berlin. Uh, yeah, and our main topic is um, housing and large housing estates in particular, so neighborhoods, uh, processes which are happening in these uh, neighborhoods uh, uh, with these, uh, these housing estates of this type. So yeah, and we've made uh, so far four lectures. This is our fifth lecture. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, today's topic will be um, introduced by Dr. Florian Urban. Um, yeah, and we are uh, very uh, welcome him to, uh, to join us. Um, uh, he's a, a professor of architectural history at the Glasgow School of Art. Yeah, and uh, today we will discuss um, the um, uh, large housing estates in particular, the uh, form of it. So. Uh, yeah, what, what's the benefits uh, of uh, comparison uh, different large housing estates uh, around the world? What, what are the, how can we benefit from it? And uh, the, uh, does it worth it uh, at the end? So yeah, because uh, mass housing is such a, um, a burning topic uh, all around the world. Yeah, so, um, and some, um, uh, Sorry, I'm switching between languages. So, uh, some um, uh, points about the uh, organization of the lecture. So, um, as you saw, you have the chat to discuss anything which uh, you um, you think of. You can write anything uh, that you want. Uh, so, yeah, greetings from all all over the world are welcome. Uh, and questions, comments uh, during the lecture, if uh, we can answer them at the end. Of the lecture, or uh, and we, we can collect them uh, and uh, to make sure that we haven't missed anything. So yeah, and please uh, push the fire button because it's the only. Uh, I think the chat, the fire button at the left from the chat, uh, the only ways to communicate with the with the lecture today. Unfortunately, uh, the platform is organized a bit yeah a bit different than uh, Zoom. Uh, for example, but still, yeah, we have uh, an opportunity to support the 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 statements and just just put the, push the fire button and uh, please uh, comment and ask the questions. We will have time to answer them all. So yeah, please, uh, floor and floor is yours. So yeah. Thank you very much, Daria, for this nice introduction. Um, I start with a few words about myself. Um, no. I'm not starting to start. I start differently. I would like to know if you're all able to use the fire button. If you can use the fire button, can you press the fire button now? Four people, seven people, eight, 11, 15 out of 30, 22, 24. We get to 30. Everybody is able to use the fire button. Yes, almost everybody. Thank you very much. That unfortunately is the only way for me to get a reaction. So. I would like to know, let's stop the fire. Can you please tell me who is currently in Moscow? Press the fire button if you're currently in Moscow. Only three people, eight people, nine people, 11 people, 11. Okay, that's one third is in Moscow. Okay, another question. Who has ever lived in a socialist or other mass housing block? Who has ever lived in one? One, two, six people, 13 people, 23, 24 people, 27 people, 27 out of 30, that's a lot. I actually also have lived in a housing block, actually in West Germany, in Munich, so it wasn't precisely socialist. And who is currently living in a housing block, like a mass housing block? I get four. I get, okay, oh, five people, five people, eight people, nine people, 
13 people, 15 people are living in a housing block. Okay, uh, that is good, 17. So more or less half of you. So half of the people are familiar with what I'm talking about. Okay, I'll proceed. I'll go, I'm going to introduce myself. If you have any questions, feel free to um, uh, uh, write them over the chat because I can actually hear the chat right away. I can see right away um, when, you, when you chat. So, as Daria has already mentioned, I'm an architectural historian. I teach at the Glasgow School of Art. I teach in an architecture department and I teach architectural history. Uh, I am not from Scotland originally. I'm originally from Germany. I was born and raised in Munich, West Germany. I have studied first in Berlin, then in the United States at the University of California in Los Angeles. I've studied, I studied urban planning there. I did my PhD in Boston at MIT, and I've been teaching in Scotland for about 10 years. And that this has been a quite interesting experience. I don't know if you know, but Scotland was called the most socialist country out of the Eastern Bloc in the 1970s and 1980s, with the sheer amount that of mass housing that was built there. This picture that you see actually is a picture of Glasgow. And a number of these housing blocks don't exist anymore. But uh, the, 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 the mass housing has been a huge topic there. I'm not sure if I can start my slides, get my slides running. Uh, no, they don't. How can I get my slides running? Uh, the Red Road Estate, yes, from Singapore. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> the Red Road Estate, it's not only the Red Road Estate, as you can see there. Uh, the Red Road Estate actually has, has actually um, um, been uh, demolished. So where, how can I get my, my slide running? Yeah, any idea? How I can do, ah, that is good. Okay, that is great. Yeah, I'm sorry, I did it, so. Um... Oh, you did it, but yeah. I, I want to do it. <laughs> How can yeah, I just it? it's below um, on the left side, it's below these slides. So, uh, switchers yeah. previous in this slide, yes, I got it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so I go back. Okay, that's me. Good. So, I did a research project 10 years ago, I started it, or more than 10 years ago, um, which actually led to this book, Tower and Slap which has recently been translated into Russian uh, under the title Vajnya i Karopka. And I'm very happy that it has been translated into Russian because in Moscow, mass housing is a highly political uh, question. And I am going to talk about that a little bit later. The point I made in this research project is uh, that Mass housing is apparently very similar all over the world. Here you see pictures of the six cities that I am treating in this book. Shanghai, Moscow, Paris, Brasilia, Mumbai, and Chicago. But actually, uh, the narratives that are connected with that are very different. And the meaning that is, that is connected with that is very different. So. My publication is set in a general academic context in which I claim that modernity is diverse. The move towards globalization in the 20th century did only apparently lead to the same forms, the same habits. If you scratch under that, you see that this particular building, can you, can you actually see? No, I see the cursor. This is the pointer. This particular building is very different from this one and is very different from, 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 from this one with regard to the people who live there, with regard to, to the political significance, and with regard to the reputation. And my analysis in this book is about how this came about, how this was conditioned historically, and how this was conditioned uh, according to different power relations and different political systems. So, um, 
I am going to talk about some contexts in which mass housing was apparently very successful, which includes particular housing estates in Spain, in India, in China, but also in, in, in formerly socialist countries such as Poland, where I spent the last half year doing research. I also have a family connection because my wife is Polish. And uh, I am also going to set the Moscow example in context. So, first of all, what is mass housing? Mass housing is a modernist vision. It is an idea that was very much connected to the big the big hope of the early 20th century to overcome the enormous housing shortage that uh, uh, was widely considered the most pressing social problem. And that wasn't only the case in Germany, it was the case in all the, 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 the um, industrialized countries, particularly in Western Europe and North America, but equally in underdeveloped countries. And the first point that I'm going to make is that nowhere have these large estates uh, actually failed. There was no failure. Everywhere mass housing has been a success if you look at the original goals. Because the original goals, why this was built, they were not to provide a fulfilling everyday life. They were not to build a creative community. They were not to foster democratic participation. As a matter of fact, many of these countries, these, these, these estates were, were built in rather dictatorial contexts. And they were also no, not necessarily uh, um, uh, to provide beautiful and uh, aesthetically pleasing cities, but exclusively uh, to provide light, air, and privacy. So the idea, which is widespread now over the world, particularly since the 1970s, that mass housing has failed, is something that r relies on criteria that were not applied when this was built. Some of these criteria actually existed, obviously also in when, when these, these, these buildings were built. There were ideas that a building should have a certain aesthetic quality and so on, but they paled against the importance of providing uh, shelter and uh, light and air and privacy. This brings me to the definition of mass housing. I'm talking about standardized um, projects I'm talking about high-rise projects, but not exclusively. I'm talking about panel blocks, but not exclusively. So the question is, how are you defining these estates that look so similar? Because again, if you scratch under the surface and you see is, you know, and all over the socialist world, you would say, oh, these are panel blocks that are built from prefabricated panels. But if you look at what was built in India at the time, they were all site built and according to, you know, if you say, oh, this is all like standardized design. Well, you look to East Germany, it's rather standardized. You look to West Germany, it's not as standardized. You know, there are all these contexts. So basically there are no definitions that would work that would apply a particular form or a particular technology. So um, the definition that I actually uh, uh, applied in my book is that mass housing is defined according to an underlying uh, ideological vision that is to provide acceptable and potentially equal dwellings for the whole of society and the idea of egalitarianism. Obviously, this is a leftist idea. Obviously, this was very widespread in the, in the socialist countries, but not exclusively. It was just as widespread in many capitalist countries. And the second idea is that there is a beneficial state that, there, that acts as a facilitator. 
The socialist planned economy was probably the most comprehensive vision of uh, this paternalistic state and uh, Obviously, you can discuss whether this is a ben benevolent or rather rather malignous force, but uh, uh, the idea of the people who built it behind that was that the state is the best facilitator for all that. That means I'm not including in my definition of mass housing um, housing blocks, for example, that were built for the luxury segments of society, what in Moscow you would find Alia Parusa or these, you know, uh, luxurious ornamented, you know, blocks that have been built in the last 20 years, and also not private housing that went up in other countries. That is not part of my definition. And this definition that I apply, that allows me to give a, a a more focused analysis that explained the different ways in which these uh, housing blocks have fared so far. So these two visions in Germany were connected with, uh, uh, on the one hand, housing reformers such as Otto Schilling or Rudolf Eberstadt, and on the other hand, with famous architects such as Walter Gropius or Ernst May or Ludwig Hilbersheimer. And these ideas spawned these much celebrated Siedlungen of the 1920s. Um, there's no particular reason why I single out the German examples, but because you had similar experiments in the 1920s in, in, in Russia, obviously, you had similar experiments in France and in many other countries. What is common with the pre-war mass housing is that these um, uh, uh, estates were too few to relieve the housing shortage at a national level. But they were visionary in their architectural forms and in their methods of production. These were the first experiments with standardization. These were the first experiments with panel, panel constructions. All this happened in the pre-war era and they were all in the service of the apocal vision to end the housing shortage. Uh, only after the Second World War was this modernist vision implemented at a broader scale. And uh, those of, who, of you who have studied Soviet housing are obviously uh, uh, familiar with the famous housing program launched by Nikita Khrushchev in 1955. Uh, but it was similar, it was paralleled at the same time by social democratic visions in Western Europe. For example, the Million program in, uh, in, in Sweden or the social democratic inspired housing in West Germany or the um, big developments in the banlieue of Paris. And again, one has to remind that after the Second World War, the um, dwelling conditions were just as appalling as they had been in the early 20th century. The average city dweller in the Soviet Union in the 1950s, mid 1950s, at the time when Khrushchev launched this program, was seven square meters per person. You can imagine that like a, a single bed is approximately two square meters, so seven square meters would be the sizes of like two single beds next to each other and a, and a wee bit more. So um, the background of this housing was a belief in progress and development and in a vision that is scientifically founded and based on expert uh, solutions. So um, this was simply because the traditional means of housing so far had not worked in providing a, a significant portion of society acceptable dwelling conditions. So my, the, my point in the book is that in some countries, large housing estates fell victim to their own success. And 
And uh, um, because once the basic needs were satisfied, new needs arrived that were not anticipated. And some aspects of these uh, housing estates were simply unforeseen. So it is an example of the volatility of attributions of good and bad. This is good architecture, this is bad architecture, this is good housing or this is bad housing. And I'm not talking about like Soviet propaganda or these things, but I'm also talking about a changing discourse in societies where you have more or less free speech. And one of these examples is uh, Western Germany. This is the Märkisches Viertel, which is the largest housing estate in West Berlin. It's on the periphery, on the northern periphery of West Berlin, and it was built uh, in the early 1960s. And uh, you can see, and it was built for from 1963 to 1974. The original goal was 50,000 inhabitants and it comprised more than 17,000 apartments, mostly in tower blocks of 10 to 14 floors. The chief designers belonged to the elite of the time, Werner Duttmann, these people here, Georg Heinrichs, Oswald Matthias Ungers, some of them are still very well acclaimed and um, uh, celebrated in the architectural history textbooks. First, the Märkisches Viertel uh, it stood for progress and organization, modernization. It stood for collective advancement and improving living standards. And then, all of a sudden, it came to mean the oppressive force of modernism, such as top-down planning, such as disenfranchisement of the individual and the neglect of traditions. And the particular important thing, or what, 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 why I find it so interesting, is that the, that the, that the, uh, um, the change from, 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 uh, uh, from boom to bust actually happened in less than one year. So you can see this from the titles uh, here, an expressive composition that embodies a will to art, you know, blah, 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 blah. sign of hope for, and then a depressing mass of monotonous slabs where housewife force, housewives apparently for no reason turn into alcoholics. So what happened between 1968 and after 1968? Well, obviously, there was the whole movement all over Europe. And in Berlin, actually, this started with an exhibit by um, uh, students of technical university who were invited by the city administration to present their vision for the city of the future. So the municipality of Berlin generously sponsored this exhibit and in return got a merciless criticism of their own policy. So if you look at this aesthetics, this looks like a swastika and obviously this is intended. We're talking about 30 years after, after the fall of the, of the Nazi regime, well, less than 30 years actually. Uh, and, uh, 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 and, you know, architects are indicted of being, of working hand in hand with speculators, with the Berlin government and with the city owned not-for-profit uh, um, uh, construction companies. So basically, who thought of themselves as being the good guys. So this student criticism was eagerly published by um, uh, Berlin, by Germany's most eminent news magazine, Der Spiegel. And Der, Der Spiegel wrote and censored the Märkisches Viertel as, quote, the bleakest product of concrete architecture, end quote. And the diagnosis was, quote, this is a gray hell. And five months later, there was a cover story uh, which quoted inhabitants who were calling their own uh, uh, buildings as a prison camp and quotes such as, I will die in this monotony. 
and uh, another inhabitant was quoted with with uh, uh, or another journalist called it actually um, an area where already four year olds are condemned to spend the future lives as unskilled laborers. The important thing for me or the interesting thing for me is that the people use the same vocabulary that only five, five um, uh, years before was used for the tenement slam, slums, for basically the 19th century buildings, these buildings that I showed before that now are considered really nice and, 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 and quaint by everybody. Um, uh, so those were the buildings that speculators had built. Those were the buildings where people were condemned to you know, spend their lives as unskilled laborers and so on, so on, so on. So what has happened? Obviously what's happened was the background of the student rebellions and the call for enfranchisement and self-determination, which were sweeping around the whole world at the time. You had protests in Berkeley and the United States. You had huge pro protests in France. You had huge protests, obviously, in Czechoslovakia that were quelled by the Russian invasion in 1968. And what all this was, was basically um, a criticism of the oppressive bourgeois society from the left. So the interesting thing is, was this was not um, a discussion between left-wing people and right-wing people. This was not a private uh, uh, or people in favor of privatization and market liberalism against people in favor of, you know, socialist intervention. No, this was moderate left-wing people, social democrats in favor of state intervention and very leftists communists and so on, in favor of more state intervention. So um, what is also most important in this in, in context is the most vocal factions were not the inhabitants. It was not uh, inhabitant protest, but it was protest by people who claimed to speak for the inhabitants, which were the uh, students. And the debate was also rather unarchitectural. Most of what criticized had virtually nothing to do with the architecture. And to prove this point, I'm going to show you a wee bit about this building. So you see, okay, this was the point I've just made. Just made. I show you this building here. So um, uh, this is the plan. Uh, the plan shows a lot of aspects that would still be considered important by most planners. Uh, it provides uh, shopping facilities, it provides youth clubs, it provides cinemas, daycare centers. It's pretty much like a micro rayon plan, which is a little bit extended to accommodate for more facilities that uh, uh, were considered more important at the time. The architecture was based on light and air and a lot of greenery, and it was very successful in this, this at, in, at that level. So look, so you, you see here the experience of nature and greenery, for example, you see the idea of variation, which particularly was aiming not at not being monotonous. It was particularly uh, designed to not repeat the mistakes of the so-called tenement slums. And it was the idea of the secluded interior garden where the uh, children would be uh, safe to play. Uh, it was uh, based on the idea of having balconies and, and, and uh, actually um, uh, responding to the requirements of the climate. For example, cold northern country, therefore you have the balconies in the south and you have the, the sort of like unimportant uh, um, whatever um, uh, 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 kitchen and so on, uh, looking towards the north. So there's a lot of, lot of. Uh, uh, so the plans were quite sophisticated in this text, and there was also a care for planning at lighting and surrounding. So, one might ask, what was the criticism? I mean, what did the students actually um, uh, and later the the, the uh, uh, criticize? So the main criticism was grayness and monotony because the greenery obviously takes a long time to grow and first the buildings were built and then people moved into the buildings and the greenery hadn't yet grown. So if they say this is concrete architecture, of course there wasn't a tree yet because the tree was just planted. Second, uh, uh, the lack of shopping opportunities and entertainment. 
that was also very clear and it had to do a lot with, with, with the way how capitalism works. You wouldn't open a shop or a pub before people move in and actually would be customers of your shop and your, your pub. So a lot of the shops actually opened much later, but the first people who moved in there had no shopping opportunities. Um, there was also the question of shoddy construction. That was probably the only architectural one. And there was the, 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 the question of breaking up old social structures because people were resettled from the working class neighborhoods in the inner city. And of course, if you resettle anyone, it always breaks up social structures. So again, it is something clear. And the last one was the high rents. And we are talking about highly subsidized rents that by any capitalist standards were at the lower end, but they were obviously still much higher than what you would play, pay for an overcrowded tenement apartment with a coal stove in the way that you would get in the inner city neighborhoods such as Kreuzberg at the time. My point is none of this referred really to the building design. I just hear that the large neighborhoods are criticized in Moscow for exactly the same issues now. Good. So um, interesting is how the uh, uh, debate over the Märkisches Viertel actually waned. And nowadays, 30 years, 50 years later, the uh, development is certainly not about the worst. Some of the technological fort shortcomings, the shoddy buildings, they were removed because there had been, um, you know, uh, post-occupancy renovations in the all, all the way through the 1970s and the 1980s. And uh, journalists also began to write more and more positively over the course of the 1970s and 1980s. They commended the amount of street life there, they commended the many playgrounds, and they also commended, interestingly enough, the civic spirit of the inhabitants. And much of the civic spirit actually, ironically, was enhanced by the common fight for a better neighborhood. They say, we want to remove our leaking roofs, therefore we had, you had citizen initiatives and so on and so on. This obviously created more, um, uh, a more civic spirit. So if you look at the structure, at the social structure of the Magrishes Viertel in the, in the 2000s, and the indicators that are generally applied to that, you see that the Märkisches Viertel is not, it is certainly not a desired neighborhood, you know, it's not, you know, where you, if you had a choice, but it is not pretty much around the average or slightly worse than the average, but certainly not much worse than the average. So um, now you can look actually at what happened of, um, uh, 10 years later. Because if you, if you look at the indicators now, actually the uh, percentage of inhabitants on social welfare has increased and the inhabitants, uh, the percentage of inhabitants with a, an immigrant background has also increased. So you see that there is an, a concentration of immigrants and social welfare uh, uh, recipients. Uh, but also you can see that at, at some level or at many levels, the um, social composition is now worse than it was in the 1970s, because in the 1970s, the number of inhabitants on social welfare was much lower, but the reputation now is much better. So you see that a lot of this why there are so many people here on social welfare and so many people who are from disadvantaged neighborhoods has much to do with the overall housing politics, housing policies in Berlin and with the lack of availability of affordable housing in other neighborhoods, so which now pushes people to this neighborhood. It has nothing to do with the planning principles and the architectural principles in this particular neighborhood. So let's look at the successful large estates. I think I have to speed up a little bit. Um, well, 
Well, this, for example, is uh, um, a successful neighborhood from uh, a, a socialist context. It was built in Warsaw in the 1950s, and uh, uh, it was built by, by a very, very prominent architect at the time. And uh, it, to date, it is a much desired neighborhood. And um, so you mind the, co the quotation marks that I gave with successful large estates, because it obviously depends on according to what success means. Success is rarely measured by the original goals. I've already made, made this point. And, uh, but then the other question is, what other points, what other uh, criteria would you uh, um, use to measure success? Would you use the length of the waiting list for people who want to move in? Well, then every housing estate in any major economic hub would be successful, including nearly every social housing project in Chicago or in New York. Is the absence of criticism already a success? Well, then every housing estate in a totalitarian country without free speech or free press would be successful as there is no criticism. Well, I think success is mostly measured by the discourse. And as I've just shown, the discourse is changeable. And now I come to the point, how, how, what actually influences the discourse? And my point is the discourse is uh, influenced by the context, the urban context and the historical context. And this case that you see here, the Sady Joliborski, uh, are functionalist neighborhoods built on exactly the same principles as many other socialist neighborhoods later, built at what the time was the periphery of Warsaw and with serial design. So it has all the advantages and disadvantages of a modernist functionalist neighborhood. It's quiet, full of light and greenery, and like the Märkisches Viertel, it's designed by a well-known architect. It's functionally separated, it's just a little bit remote, and the greenery can also not really be used in the way that a lot of people would like to use greenery. You cannot really play football there or whatever. But it's well designed and given the high quality of design in the early post-war years, it is to date a desired neighborhood. But probably much more important were the citywide factor. This is a neighborhood which already before the Second World War was an upscale desired neighborhood, well reputed. Second factor, in Warsaw, given that the city was comprehensively destroyed by the Germans in the end, at the end of the Second World War, there is next to no alternative for modernist housing. So um, you don't really have 19th century housing where people could move to. So, um, even though the flats here are small by today's standards, hardly anyone could afford to move out. And also what was built in the decades afterwards had much worse qualities. Here we have another example of a quote unquote successful neighborhood from Valladolid. And the main um, importance here is that in Spain, just like in Italy and in some other Southern European countries, modernist housing was never demonized. There were no cases such as Pruitt Igo or Sarcel or Bailmamea or Wellingby. And modernist housing is to date well liked by the middle classes. This development actually was built in the 1980s, long after um, uh, uh, people in uh, Northwestern Europe would have um, built uh, uh, mass housing. Uh, and it repeats all the quote-unquote mistakes of the uh, 1970s. It's functionalist design, more or less large developments, and so on, so on, so on. So we have 15-story high-rise towers with brown brick-faced facades. And uh, on the other hand, you have advantages. You have spacious plans because it's built for middle-class families and uh, um, you, you also have many facilities though that, that cater to middle-class families, restaurants and so on, uh, 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 parking garages. But 
an important thing to think about is Valladolid has an old town. It has substantial 19th century building stock, but nonetheless, this is more desired. Parque Sol has a more approximately 30,000 inhabitants, so we're talking about 10% of the population of Valladolid. I could go on and on and show how um, certain buildings or certain the reputation of certain estates are influenced by the urban context and by the historical context. Particularly if one looks beyond Europe, because there are many contexts in which the affluent live in functionalist tower blocks and have always had that. Shanghai is a particularly telling example, which has a long tradition of uh, uh, prominent high-rise housing going back to the pre-Second World War era. Um, so my point is that it depended on particular country, cultural context and particular historical development, whether or not a large development was demonized. So obviously we cannot choose this. It doesn't mean that this, you know, a context in which these buildings were demonized can easily be reversed. And in Europe or in Western Europe and particularly in Scotland, um, the uh, demonization, the bad reputation has been so strong and so long lasting that nowadays almost there very there's almost no politician who uh, um, who would speak in favor of uh, um, well um, building new large scale housing blocks. As a matter of fact, many of them are uh, torn down. But my point is that even in the context in which we have bad reputation, uh, there are areas that still um, retain a rather good reputation. The development Gelasno and Bramon in Warsaw is still a, um, a, 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 a comparatively stable neighborhood. It's certainly not a slum. It's much criticized because it has shoddy construction, it has small flats, and uh, uh, it destroyed one of the city's historical axes. But on the other hand, it has a central location. There's good access to services and good access to, to public transport. And given that it is still administered, uh, administered by the um, old formerly socialist housing cooperative, uh, uh, it has comparatively low rents. And the same happens with the central neighborhoods uh, on, in, in East Berlin, as you see here in the Karl Marx Alley, which are still comparatively desired. I would like to present a very, very particular case of large housing estates and of policies connected with large housing estate, which is Vienna. And it's a context in, that has a lot to show to other countries. The city prides itself of a century old, far ranging approach to modern housing, based on egalitarianism and state paternalism. And going back to the municipal housing programs of the 1920s, the famous Red Vienna programs. If you look, for example, at these buildings, they are probably not uh, of Vienna's most attractive neighborhoods, but from my Glasgow perspective, uh, it, it seems well maintained. It is certainly not a ghetto, and it has a low degree of marginalization and uh, inhabitants that are from underprivileged backgrounds. But if we look at more recent examples of mass housing, defined by um, vision to end the housing shortage, uh, egalitarianism and state involvement, we would look at this one, which is basically from the uh, early 2000s. It is not a socialist housing estate, but it is a large estate and, estate and built on many socialist principles. It's built for 20,000 inhabitants and 17,000 workspaces, although currently only the first phase has been complete, completed. This is not a counter proposition, proposition to the large housing estates of the socialist or early modernist period. 
it has modern and postmodern post functionalist elements the modern elements built on light and air most of the architecture is a variation of modernism and this is built on the modernist vision to change society for the better through architecture that's very important this has been more or less continuous in austria but among the post functionalist slash postmodern principles are the commitment with the dense city. This is built in the city center and built on density. The rejection of the automotive city. This is not built for car ownership. And the search for a varied, non monotonous architecture. And also the participatory process and the non hierarchical decision making that led to this project. So, we are talking about social policy through architecture. The ensemble, for, for example, that you see here, that is part of this development, called Bike, Bike and Swing, Swim, features about 500 bike spaces and only 104 spaces for cars. We're talking about approximately 230 dwelling units. The saved money was used for a spa area, which you can see there, which includes a sauna, a fitness room, a sun deck, and a spectacular pool on the roof that you see in the upper left corner. And now, hold your breath. The rent is approximately, huh? how much is it? For 80 square meters, like a two bedroom flat, a three, three room flat, approximately 600 euros. So tell this to a Londoner and they think you're in Wonderland. Tell this to a Muscovite and they think you're crazy. It's completely normal for a pe person in London or in, in, in Moscow to pay 80% of their income for uh, rent. So also other uh, European cities subsidize housing production, but nowhere, I would say, is it so efficiently controlled as in Vienna. A developer, if they want to build something, they have to make a binding commitment for a particular rent level. So you wouldn't get planning permission as a developer from the municipality if you do not commit to a particular rent level. You can do completely private housing, but, 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 but then obviously you also need planning permission, but you would get no subsidy. And the overwhelming majority of what is built in, in, in Vienna is subsidized by the municipality. So the deal is always, you want to receive money from the municipality, you would, would, would have to play by their rules. So, uh, 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 and this is actually controlled, and that is the important thing, you know. Vienna is this thing, you know, Wien bleibt Wien, Vienna never changes. Actually, in Vienna, these commitments work. You get planning permission, and then six years later, whatever construction starts, and another five years later, this is uh, finished, and so on. And still, the commitments for the rent level are binding. This is very, very rarely the case in cities such as London, London for example. So these facilities that are offered, swimming pools, party rooms, roof gardens, and so on. And by the bike infrastructure, I don't only mean bike lifts and bike sheds, but also so-called mixed mobility concepts. That means when you live in this house, you're a member of the housing association, obviously, that runs this. And then you get particular access to car sharing agencies. And... Um, there were also flats desi uh, uh, um, designed for particular groups. You have flats that are designed, for example, for young people who wouldn't find uh, uh, cheap flats otherwise. There are also flats that are designed for immigrants, obviously very few one, and you can criticize that and so on, but it as leads, there is the will to do that. So um, question, what's, what's the downside? What's the catch, you would ask? Well, from my perspective, the there are very few catches. Well, the one catch is obviously that also in Vienna, a good flat in a central location is a scarce community. And it's very, very difficult to get a, 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 a contract here. And yes, I wouldn't talk of flat, of, of, of flat out corruption, but it is still difficult to get a contract here. Also, the design process was very complicated and very, very bureaucratized, and in some respects, really, really wasteful. You can go on the on the on the on the um, 
uh, website of the Vienna municipality and you see all these planning documents and that every little small, you know, area had its own competition and then you had like different tiers of, 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 of uh, competitions and decision making, blah, 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 various juries, many different architects, a very, very uh, complicated, convoluted process. But at a social level, as well, as well as the level of individual buildings, I would say it does work. So the um, oh, here you see that. So at the um, oops, the Vienna example, uh, Vienna has instruments for which the city is is being envied all over Europe, which is on the one hand the state responsibility for housing, which actually is an ongoing um, right since the 1920s. Because in the 1980s, when all over Europe neoliberal ideologies kicked in which applies to Britain and even more, you know, to countries where socialism ended, I mean, uh, actually in all the state intervention even increased. The citizen is pretty much sheltered from the fluctuation of the market and the municipality rate takes responsibility for maintenance. So the term Gemeindewohnung uh, compare its meaning to that of council flat, you know, the Gemeinde, it means exactly the same, council flat, Gemeindewohnung, but Gemeindewohnung has a positive um, connotation and council flat has a negative connotation. So uh, the, what the, the chance that, that, or the opportunity that Vienna has is doing social innovation through housing policy. Well, also Moscow, has a long tradition of state involvement into the housing uh, market. And the, the Khrushchevsky have been widely criticized for being shoddily built and poorly designed. But at the time when they were built, they also improved the standards of living immensely. I already mentioned the amount of seven square meters for the average uh, Soviet city dwellers in uh, at 1955. So um, a two-room unit in a Khrushchevka has approximately 44 square meters and it was designed for a four-headed family. So just do the maths, that would give almost 12 square meters per inhabitant, so it would already double the average standard. Also, the, 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 the Brezhnev era housing can be criticized for monotony or poor construction, but it was also very effective at other levels. In 1975, this is approximately when these buildings were, were, uh, um, were uh, 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 finished, 98% uh, of Moscow had central heating. In West Berlin, for example, eh? rich capitalist city, the amount, uh, the share was only uh, about, uh, um, about 60 percent. So uh, the goal of equal housing conditions was also largely achieved, certainly compared to the Russian society nowadays. The Russian society of the late socialist era was much more egalitarian because the amount of party functionaries that led a significantly better life than the average was very, very small, much smaller than it is nowadays. And the difference between the party functionary in 1980 and the average Soviet citizen is much smaller than the difference between the oligarch nowadays and the average Russian citizen. So homelessness was significantly smaller than it is now. And again, I am not trying to uh, 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 um, uh, to to, uh, um, to hide the significant downsides of these uh, uh, buildings. Obviously, uh, Soviet housing was an instrument of control, and it was an instrument for the establishment of communist party rule, and thus part on parcel of a totalitarian regime. So this was not just apart from any other policies that the Soviet regime has had for the control and the repression uh, that it exerted over its citizens. But there are even also the other side. So the question, should we get rid of this? 
My point is, one question is if mass housing from the socialist period is fit for purpose and if it could be improved. Uh, and another, um, uh, or if you may be, there are cases in which it would be better to abolish this. And these are important questions, but it's a very different question from the question, should inhabitants be forcefully removed? And obviously, this is a question that obviously has to be answered, but no, uh, from a democratic and human rights perspective. So this is currently happening in Moscow. So we are seeing one of the dark sides of modernist housing or of housing, top-down planning and the practice which is vulnerable to all kinds of corruption. And this is, 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 is something that has been criticized or that was the main criticism in West Berlin in 1968. And this is happening in Moscow at the time, but not necessarily only in Moscow because it's happening in many other places as well. So my, well, what I would say that these buildings are clearly ambivalent. On the one hand, uh, they are connected to the protective aspects of the paternalistic state who guarantees low rents and sheds its citizens from homelessness. On the other hand, they are connected to a potentially uh, repressive force that controls and ideologically infiltrates its subjects. So this ambivalence is strong and it has been running all the way basically from 1955, from the Khrushchev era to the present day. And in this respect, also Soviet large housing or Moscow, Russian large housing estates are in some way, ways determined by their history reaching back to the 1950s. So conclusion. Um, well, first of all, the, con the context is crucial. Large housing estates as such are not a problem. In the Märkisches Völkel, for example, the context was the forced resettlement of inner city dwellers and the destruction of valuable 19th century buildings, as well as top-down decision-making. Um, scale is a problem because it is usually easier to um, uh, adapt your strategies if the scales are small. So small scale and mixed use, the quote unquote postmodern, like the post-functionalist of aspects of housing are certainly some that help. And wherever you find mass housing that has small scale and uh, a mixed use, uh, they, have, they are much more likely to be better reputed. So um, I would say that this, the state has to show some kind of involvement, uh, not merely as a facilitator for the interests of the real estate interest, uh, industry, as it was the case in 1980s and 1990s Great Britain, but also not as a central planner, as it was the case in the socialist countries and in many you know, social democratic contexts in Western Europe. So the state should be a mediator and a regulator that you, as you, for example, would find in some countries, including Vienna, including Copenhagen. So housing is a powerful tool for changing society for the better, and it should be used as such. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for your lecture. Yeah, we will wait for the questions. Uh, I think uh, people uh, just uh, thinking about the, and formulating them at the moment. And for me, uh, it's it's like it's very uh, interesting and um, a bit um, 
obvious that the architecture itself uh, is not a like a solution and and given answer to uh what will be the life of the residents there what will be the like the uh condition of this housing or policy around them so yeah that's um the story about the um different context in politics is very important, uh, especially, especially for uh, Moscow, because sometimes, uh, as, I, um, as I said, uh, in new, uh, <laughs> you see the comments in Shalia. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for example, uh, now in uh, Moscow, uh, new large house in the States are criticized the same way as the, um, for example, as you said, in uh, Mekish Spirit in Berlin, uh in the 60s so yeah it's the um um the point of architecture we'll see yeah okay now i i'm getting the first question so the first question should i yeah okay the first question i said can, can actually everybody read the the uh, uh the the talk okay so from any snekalina do you think the big buildings in the city are progress or regression in urban development uh, no, I, well, neither one nor the other. I think they are a given. The world, the population of the world is is is, is growing exponentially, and uh, uh, the only way to actually accommodate uh, all the people that are on this planet is in big buildings. So I think I think by these very very at this very very basic level, the idea of the single family housing with a garden around is an outdated idea, or it is it's simply not possible how it nowadays. So so I I actually would um, uh, uh, I'm very much against the narrative of progress or. Um, backwardness because it's a very modernist way of thinking you know uh, very much you know there was a level that society is actually progressing so second question you talked about the ambivalence of soviet housing to what extent you do you discover this ambivalence socialist ideology in current russian discourses oh this is very hard for me because i don't even have um uh, know any any uh, uh, russian discourses because i unfortunately don't speak russian i uh, I learned Russian for one year and I can read it, but I don't understand it. So I cannot really tell you about the Russian discourses nowadays. Um, all the research I did uh, was on the Soviet era housing and that was through translations and through research assistance. Um, I see that in, in other socialist countries, which, which I'm familiar, which is former socialist East Germany and which is Poland, uh, there is uh, um, a discussion about state involvement, and uh, but it is rarely uh, framed as such. Uh, it is not against people who say we need more market and people who see who who, we, who, who, who they say who need less market. It is more about practice. And that is rather unfortunate because there are some cases in which certain um, policies of the socialist era have continued and are actually continuing doing good things at a very basic level. For example, certain portions of the, of the, of the housing cooperative legislation from the socialist era led to the fact that large portions of the population who already have owned or who already have owner occupied their flats during the socialist era cannot be kicked out. Do you have that in similar in, in, in certain socialist countries? I think this is a good thing and this obviously has to do with state involvement. But the problem is that a lot that is happening now in the former socialist countries is based on a laissez-faire approach, which again has to do with the bad reputation that planners have there. You know, when people say planning, they always think of the of the of the planning of the socialist era, and you know, yeah. So that is a problem. Um, any other questions? If we come back to architecture, what are the reasons for the comeback of modern architectural uh, uh, modernist architectural de design? In my opinion, is it a sign of a housing crisis creeping back in many cities? Uh, certainly, at um, at the level of students. When I talk to my students, there are a lot of students there who have an interest of resolving the housing crisis because it's obvious. 
Um, you see that in discourses that you find in Scotland, you know, neoliberalism is out. Doesn't mean that, uh, uh, that there is efficient legislation now to curb the uh, basically rampant uh, polarization between uh, rich and poor and the sort of skyrocketing of housing prices. This is happening in Scotland as well, but at least ideologically people do not, um, uh, 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 no longer say that, you know, neoliberalism and the market is the future. Um, the question why modern architecture becomes more popular. Obviously, there is a dynamic of what your, what your grandfather liked is what your father disliked and what you like again. So there is a question of that as well, but not exclusively. Criticisms. Have there been criticism that there's too much intervention in the provision of affordable housing in Vienna? Yes, very much so. And that is the interesting thing. There is very much so. And um, um, the reason why uh, they, this has been criticized, it has been criticized for being over, over bureaucratized. It has been criticized for uh, being um, not too accessible for marginalized groups. So if you are, for example, if you come from Russia, you move to Vienna, you will have a very hard time getting in there. And the reason is not that you're barred from being getting in there because it's more that you need a lot of, you know, knowledge, not knowing not of people to, to basically establish yourself there. But then you can also say, well, these discourses are also discourses that are happening in Vienna because Vienna measures itself against Vienna. They don't say, oh, we are doing so much better than Birmingham and shouldn't we be proud of ourselves that what happens in Birmingham is not what is happening here. That is a problem that you have everywhere. What do I think about social housing programs? I am very much in favor of social housing programs. Uh, because of not finished privatization in a lot of Russian large housing estates, we can observe a fragmented ownership structure. There are state tenants and owners living in the same buildings. This can create conflicts between the residents when it comes to demolition reconstruction project. Regarding this and what you said about Vienna, would you advocate for a society fully consisting of renters and how does the ownership structure um, blah, blah, blah wait a minute, uh, uh, divide residents in Vienna. And um, this is a very, very interesting point because uh, one of the big plans, not necessarily in Vienna, but in many other uh, uh, um, areas of the world, for example, in the United States and in Chicago, uh, is we want mixed tenure. And mixed tenure is exactly that. They say, this should be the future. We want tenants and owners in the same buildings because then we have the tenants uh, uh, who have the advantage of having affordable housing and we have the owners and there we have the advantages that people care more of their buildings. It remains to see what, uh, uh, um, uh, what is being made out of that. Usually, um, uh, uh, well, I think in the, in the United States it is a programmatic idea and there I would say it is actually a good policy. Um, the policy has big downsides. It has the downside that actually there are not enough available flats for the inhabitants of social housing. So they basically tore down social housing blocks and of all the inhabitants in there, 10% get resettled in the new mixed income housing which means that 90% of the people are evicted without anything. So that is a bad policy. But if you look at the mixed tenure in and of itself, it could be a, big, a good policy. Um, do I be, are, am I in favor of a society uh, consisting of renters? This is a very difficult question. You know, I was born and raised in Germany and I'm now in Berlin and Berlin is a city that is consisting, uh, uh, it's 85% renters, tenants. If you compare it to London, London is less than 50% tenants. The big advantage that I see in Berlin is that you have an open discourse that focuses on tenants. If uh, uh, rents are going up, there are newspapers 
who, 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 uh, who are against this, who write articles that shouldn't be the case. If I look in Scotland, also in Scotland, 50, well, in Glasgow, 55% of people are tenants, but the discourse is entirely focused on homeowners. Actually, also left-leaning uh, uh, neighbor, uh, left-leaning uh, um, uh, uh, newspapers are celebrating the rise in house prices because the focus is on the security of the investment, and it's not on the uh, uh, basically comfort of of tenants. So, I would be very much in favor of a discourse that doesn't see housing first and foremost as an investment that needs to be protected, of course, because housing is a human right, it's not an investment. And uh, uh, I'm very much in, 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 in favor of a discourse that focuses on renters. I see, on the other hand, that it is possibly something that is also not... Um, it's very difficult nowadays to, 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 to basically turn the tide and go more renting because all the signs are more ownership. So where are the directions of my current research on large housing estates? Actually, I'm now focusing mostly on the post-functionalist housing. So all the research that I have been doing in the last years are focusing on housing that is built uh, um, since the 1970s. If you look at my book, The New Tenement, this is called, this is basically um, housing in different, like, po including the Vienna example that I've, that I've just shown, uh, that uh, looks at the architecture of post-functionalist housing. What do you think about the current spread of large housing Panelki and the post-Soviet cities, the large housing estates that are built right now may resemble the Brezhnev era housing and be more gray and depersonalized, but considered as a desirable housing by citizens. It's a matter of context. Um, well, the short answer is yes, it's a matter of context. If you have homelessness, then it's better to build a panelic, panelak, <laughs> panel building, <laughs> uh, uh, than to build nothing. Uh, um, if I have a choice, then I would probably not build in Panelki. Um, but uh, um, if I am building Panelki, I would make sure that the Panelki are uh, um, uh, developed according to the context, that there is a certain flexibility, that there is mixed use in the neighborhood, that th there is good public transport, and so on. Comment some books on history of housing estates. Oof. Write me an email <laughs> and I might, I might recommend you something. Uh, uh, but be more specific what exactly you would like to, to know. Uh, did I? Yeah, you see my email address. Um, how do you see the role of the modern planner in this ever-changing society where there seems to be this stark divide between poor socialist idea and never a liberal planning context? Very, very difficult question again, and it would take another uh, uh, two hours to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about two hours. Um, I think that that well, planning in and of itself has is connected with the idea of a common good and of the common wheel. Uh, so, uh, and this is what it should be. Uh, unfortunately, this also leads to the fact that 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 uh, that, that that planning is somewhat on the wane. Uh, um, the planners were were had their most uh, important period in the mid 20th century, and this is when they have have wreaked most havoc and uh, have completely uh, uh, um, uh, destroyed their own reputation because of things such as Prudigo. So it's difficult to uh, rescue this um, uh, uh, reputation. But I think that a planner should be um, a facilitator and a mediator and should be committed to questions of. Um, the public wheel. Um, what else? Yeah. Good. Good.
Good. If there are no more questions, please um, uh, uh, email me if you have any questions, because this has been a long day, and I see already that there, uh, 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 the number of no, the per number of participants hasn't waned. There's still 30, 30, uh, 32 people. So if have, if you have another question, please ask it now. Otherwise. I think Daria is going to end the session. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, why button means, yeah, means like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no more questions, maybe. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Good. Thank you very much and hope to see you thank again. You. At some point. I am going to, to go offline now. Okay, bye bye. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, bye bye for it. Goodbye. And we'll go see you next Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, please join our next lectures next Wednesday at the same time. Uh, we will talk about Berlin, uh, I think, uh, about um, large housing estates again, neighborhoods, and uh, renovation of uh, large housing estates. So, yeah, please join us at the same time. Uh, so, yeah, uh, good, um, good. Yeah, have a good evening, good uh, afternoon, uh, whenever you are. So yeah, thank you very much for joining us. So yeah, goodbye everyone. Yes. See you next time. Thank you very much for joining. <laughs>